for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. The creationist response to these problems is that, well, Neanderthals were hypermutating. They had faster mutation rates, and that explains why they're so different from the rest of Homo sapiens. Even though they share a common ancestor, we, we can explain those differences based on the fact that they just experienced more mutations. Now, that's not the case. This claim is just a post hoc addition to the creationist model to solve the unsolvable problems that we just identified. In fact, if you claim Neanderthals were hypermutating, you actually create more problems. For example, based on the available genomes, Neanderthals had less genetic diversity than extant humans. So here's a paper talking about how Neanderthals were highly inbred. And if you look at that and you see how they're lacking in genetic diversity, well, lacking in genetic diversity is incompatible with being hypermutating. Because if you experience a lot of mutations, what are you generating? More genetic diversity. So the hypermutating hypothesis is just contradicted by the data. <clears throat> According to our model, the early post-flood human population, let's say between 1,000 to 10,000, was split apart at Babel, okay? And a lot of these subgroups, the Neanderthals being one of them, they would have split off into harsh environmental conditions, of course, but not only that, they would be isolated and therefore uh, inbreeding would take place. And we see that in, in their genome. They have high levels of homozygosity, 40% less fit than modern humans, um, highly inbred. You know, nobody would disagree with that fact. But here's the thing. The fact that different groups went different directions on the globe and each saw different, what, environmental pressures. They experienced different demographic pressures. They were subject to different mutational events. For example, the Neanderthals, uh, the evidence seems to suggest that they were hyper mutating. Um, now, somebody like Dr. Dan has a very unscientific argument against the hyper mutation hypothesis. Um, he'll say because they're highly inbred, which reduces genetic diversity, that means they cannot also be hypermutating because mutations by definition add diversity. Okay, um, David, uh, I'll let you take 10 seconds of my time. Would you agree with Dr. Dan that hypermutation and in inbreeding can't go hand in hand? Um, I, would, I would, for the most part, I would agree with Dr. Dan. What would be your reasoning why? Well, I guess we can see the same thing in like the cheetah population and other populations today that are highly inbred. And we simply don't see the hypermutation that we would see in the Neanderthal population. No, um, what he's saying is because they're highly inbred, which means they had low levels of genetic diversity, they had lower lo levels of genetic diversity compared to modern humans. That means by definition, they couldn't have been hypermutated. But let me ask you the question, okay? Especially if we're looking at the mitochondrial DNA, for example, and why they're um, very divergent from, from humans, okay? So like, for example, um, African populations have more DNA differences and diversity than non-Africans, and Neanderthals have even more than that in their mitochondrial DNA. Now, let me ask you, uh, David, what DNA compartment is larger, the nuclear D uh, DNA or the mitochondrial DNA? Um, I'm not quite sure off the top of my head. I believe it is the um, mitochondrial DNA. No, the so for example, the nuclear DNA is about 3.4 billion letters. The mitochond so with the nuclear DNA, we inherit two copies. Okay, we get three billion letters from mom, three billion letters from dad. And during sexual recombination, of course, uh, you know, genetic material is swapped. And that's where we get novel phenotypes and uh, diversity, of course. <laughs> now, here's the You're thing. A legend. You're a legend, Stand for Truth. I mean, Brother honestly, Jason. They, they just cannot, they just cannot refute you in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. It is <laughs> so funny to watch. I haven't, so gotten funny. My turn. I haven't gotten my turn to refute <laughs> standing for truth oh, no. yet, so oh, let's, no. not, let's not jump to conclusions there, Jason. <laughs> We're going to have fun. And Jason, I'm glad you're here. This is going to be a good night. Okay, so 
Um, yeah, so the fact is mitochondrial DNA, and you can Google it, David, it's only 16,000 letters long. Yeah. Very, very yeah. small DNA compartment. Yeah, you're Perfect. right. Uh, I'm sorry. I got, I, I'm hyper dyslexic, and sometimes these terms just get mixed up in my mind. So, yeah, you're, you're definitely correct with that. It is definitely the nuclear DNA. What's the nuclear DNA? Oh, I'm hyper dyslexic order. as well, but I can say the truth. <laughs> I'll put it this way, and, and, and nothing against you, David. If, if any of us would have got that question wrong in Dr. Dan's uh, challenge, we never would have been able to live that down. So, But it's okay. It's, it's a learning opportunity. But and, and, and this is why Dr. Dan, his challenge is a little bit like he's posturing. Because Dr. the Dan's fact that you got that like question a wrong. Like a child now, it is, it is kind him. of. It is kind of basic genetics, you know, that the mitochondrial DNA is only 16,000 letters long versus the nuclear DNA. But that's okay that you, because you don't need to know everything for us to have a good conversation. But Dr. Dan seems to think that, you know, we all need to uh, take his evolutionist pop quiz in order to have a discussion about these issues. So I, I just want to point out that I think his challenge is a little bit, uh, has to do with posture. Childish. So, childish. Yeah, I would agree. So. Uh, yeah, so let, let, let me refute. Uh, this isn't the first time I've refuted Dr. Dan on this, but this means, okay, since we agree on the size differences between nu nuclear uh, DNA and mitochondrial DNA, the hypermutation would have a big effect, okay, an incredibly big effect on uniparentally inherited DNA, okay? As we talked about earlier, that's your mitochondrial DNA. And, uh, David, do you know what our other uh, uniparentally inherited DNA is? Amazing. So it's, it's our Y chromosome, of course, right? So that's passed on from father to sons. And mitochondrial DNA is passed on from mothers to... We only get mitochondrial DNA from our mothers. So now for biparentally inherited DNA, like the nuclear DNA, for one, created heterozygosity would still apply, okay? So that means Neanderthals would already have had millions of created differences. Here's the thing. The corresponding increase due to the hypermutation would be virtually undetectable in the, in the nuclear genome. The reason why is because there's 3.4 billion letters. So a few extra mutations, it's not going to counterbalance the what? The inbreeding. The inbreeding would be the biggest problem and would have the greatest impact on the nuclear genome. But that uniparentally inherited DNA, the mitochondrial DNA, that can be more diverse because it's only 16,000 letters long. And when you have that hypermutation taking place, you're going to get more diversity and you're going to get more DNA differences. So Dr. Dan is wrong. I've said it many times and he just needs to concede the point. It's entirely scientific to have the biparentally inherited DNA, the nuclear DNA, be less diverse from inbreeding than modern humans, of course, because that's what we're looking at with genetic markers, and the uniparentally inherited DNA be more diverse. And that's exactly what we see in the Neanderthals. So people like Dr. Dan need to come up with better arguments as far as I'm concerned. When you actually look at the direct evidence, for example, um, molecular clocks, like what are your thoughts on the, I mean, I know you've heard me speak of it before. What do, like if we go as close to home as possible, for example, let's look at humans and we look at observed uh, mitochondrial DNA mutation rates, just looking at the observed mutation rate, you know, not making up hypothetical mutation rates in the past and fitting them with, uh, you know, calibrating them with the fossil record. 
Um, cause the, 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 the point in question is the deep time because everything you're looking at and, um, the so-called transitions you're looking at in the fossil record that is, that assumes deep time evolution. But I'm saying that the number of species today on the planet don't reflect deep time, deep time evolution. Um, therefore, that's the point in question. So we just want to look at the mutation rates today, not only in the mitochondrial DNA, but also in the Y chromosome. Why do those only take humans back uh, both in the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome? Because this is what I find to be fascinating evidence. Why, does, um, why do those numbers? the number of DNA differences, let's just start with the mitochondrial DNA. Why does that only take us back to a mitochondrial Eve roughly um, 6,000 years ago? Uh, go ahead, Snake, take your time. Uh, well, it's, I mean, estimates range from like 200,000 to like 7,000. Um, well, and, the 200. And that's that's just well, go going ahead, back, sorry. that's just going back to a common ancestor. So we don't really, we can't really use those clocks to determine the actual age of them just like when they split well i'm not i'm not referring to yeah like your your 200,000 year dates for the um for the mitochondrial leave that are derived that's because they take the dates from the secular papers so the observed like for example the parsons paper you know that um was adopted by the fbi it's so good it's so consistent which takes eve back six thousand years but when you read the details of the paper they assume evolution so yeah they'll calibrate it with the fossil record and conclude that eve uh, the mother of all living um, the last um, mitochondrial DNA common ancestor was 200,000 years ago. But remember, that's based on the um, fossil record. That's based on geology and phylogeny-based assumptions. But remember, here, if we're if we're looking to the models um, and we're looking at the differenti differentiating evidence, I would be questioning the deep time uh, paradigm, the deep time assumption. So I'm not going to assume the deep time um evolutionary model when looking at these observed mutation rates. So when we actually look at the actual empirically observed mutation rate for, let's say, mitochondrial DNA, well, that always takes her back just thousands of, of years ago. So yeah, I, I understand what you're saying about the 200,000 years ago, but that's only when they calibrated with the fossil record. So just stick to like your pedigree-based studies. You know, why is that not compelling to you? And take your time, Snake, whatever you have to say. Well, I did also want to get you uh, to send me those studies so I could read it because I can't quite find what you're talking about. But um, of course, I, I could sh screen share them right now. If, but I mean, we can't read them on the spot, so I, it might just be better for me to um, send them to you, and, and you could. You yeah, have you read? Link, have um, you read the Parsons paper at least? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. Okay, no, and that's fine. Um, but. I mean, there's a lot of things, mitochondria, well, there, there's a different differentiation in mutation rate as well. Right. We know that sometimes mutation rates are high, sometimes they're lower. Um, they're, that's about all they're I can consistent. Say. They're consistent um, for the most part, right? And, and there's certain things like... Um, heteroplasmy and there's certain things that need the population histories population sizes that need to be considered um but that's why i always say that um the deciding factor as to which model is strongest is going to come down to who's making better testable prediction i'm taking the challenge to them now and saying hey Let's go out and there's a, there's a fox in the woods. I bet you I can tell you how fast his mutation rate is. So I understand with what you're saying that if you assume deep time evolution, you have to calibrate those observed numbers from pedigree based studies with the fossil record. Okay. To come up with, um, to come up with the evolutionary Eve date. But like I said before, you know, that's the, that's the point in question. So evolutionists can say, Hey, listen, in the past, mutation rates in the mitochondrial DNA were significantly slower because some of them actually say like between 10 and 30 times slower. But here's the thing, who's making the best testable predictions? And then you're not new to this snake. You know that Dr. Jensen has taken the observed 
mutation rates in mitochondrial DNA in non-African people groups. And he's saying, okay, this is how confident I am with the Eve date of 6,000 years. He's looked at some African tribes where their mutation rate has not yet been measured. And he's made a, a future testable prediction as to how fast or how quickly their DNA changes or mutates in the mitochondrial DNA. And that's a prediction on print. So in order for an explanation to be scientific and not just post hoc, ad hoc or rescue device or non-science, for example, testable predictions have to flow. They have to flow from that explanations. Therefore, I mean, are you aware of any evolutionists that are making mitochondrial DNA predictions on people groups? Let's say some of these African tribes like the Khoisan peoples whose mutation rate has not yet been measured. Well, I need, I do need to read those, uh, papers from Jensen. Like I've read some of his papers, like the synergistic epistasis I found, a couple other ones I found, but I can't I can't find what you're talking about with well, I think that's the mitochondrial stuff. I think the synergistic is um Dr. Sanford in regards to genetic oh, yeah, San, it was Sanford, yeah you're yeah, right. And, and that's fine and that's fine. We can um we can talk about that as well. But when it comes to molecular clocks, that's why he's saying hey I, you can point me to some fox in the woods or you can point me to some animal species and I will tell you, I will predict how quickly that animal mutates. You know, he's, he's, he's going on the offense and he's making these predictions because he's, we are all, we're questioning the, um, the fossil record, the deep time um, claimed evolutionary history and these just observed mutation rates. And we can even look to the, um, the Y chromosome, but real quick on the mitochondrial DNA, I found it funny that, and you can look at these papers before, of course, not only until after the um, shock of, of the evolutionary community as to, as to the amount of mitochondrial DNA differences, that exist, did they actually look to um, coalescence to explain all these um, differences? So they're invoking um, coalescence as a post hoc evolutionary explanation to explain away the data. But, and, and if you put yourself in, in the mindset of a young earth creationist, if just, if just basic observed mutation rates in the mitochondrial DNA just, take the Eve date back to 6,000 years, which is exactly what the dates add up to in the Bible, why would we then take those dates and those numbers and calibrate them with the fossil record? Like that's, um, you know, that, that wouldn't make any sense. No, it's, it, it makes better sense to now make more testable predictions, which Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has, um, has done. And even in his debate with Dr. Vanima, who's an evolutionary biologist, he even, um, he even kind of praised Jensen for that. He said, that's, that's a good prediction to make, you know, and he admitted he can't make it because um, according to deep time evolution, there's so many different factors, so many different historical demographics, so many different population histories that it's difficult, but it's not impossible. All the evolutionists would have to do is predict how fast or no, the, the evolutionists would have to predict, you know, when does the mutation rate slow down? When does it accelerate? Look at a certain population where their mutation rate hasn't been measured. Like this is entirely possible, but the question is why aren't they, why aren't they doing it? And I, I know I talked a lot there, but that the reason why is because molecular clocks really are. Um, we, we can trace back the history of humanity in our DNA. The clock ticks from generation to generation. So uh, yeah, go ahead. Wait, what, what are your thoughts on that, uh, Snake? Well, yeah, I mean, I wanted to read the stuff by Jensen before I comment too much on it. Um, but again, we we know that like there are multiple animals that have widely different mutation rates and different parts of the genome mutate more often than other parts of the genome, uh, things like that. Uh, well, I, believe other, I believe like other animals were calculated to be much older than the six or 7,000 year old pedigree for humans using the same methods. Um, and I wanted to get more into genetics a little later on. I still have a couple of, uh, of course, of course, like more follow well, me, questions. Hey, let me just, let, let me just make one last comment on that real quick, because for the most part, cause I have a paper here that suggests that mammals, mammal wise, most mutation rates 
are pretty well consistent. Now, I don't want to say constant because, yeah, they can fluctuate a little bit, but they're consistent. They're not 10 to 30 times slower in the past like the evolutionists say. Mitochondrial DNA, for example, uh, ticks fast. These, these clocks are fast universally among all species. Now, here's the thing that's different. Generation times. That's why Jensen will look at the generation time, right? He can look at other factors as well, and that's where these – um, they could look, for example, the Khoisan peoples, like some of the African people groups, uh, their generation times um, seem to have been a lot different in the past. Therefore, that would reflect a, a slightly faster mutation rate. And that's why he's making a prediction to test whether or not that's true. And then, and before you get to that question, I do, we can, we can end it there on the mitochondrial DNA until you study that a little further. I'll send that to you. But are you then familiar with the Y chromosome now with these papers that are suggesting that it uh, mutates, it, it ticks faster than was ever expected. And now those, what are those Y chromosome differences, as fascinating as it is, only goes back just about 4,500 years. And we know exactly what happened 4,500 years. That was, um, that was Noah. He would be our last Y chromosomal common common ancestor. And, and those sequences found in the Y chromosome are nothing like the sequences found in the chimpanzee Y chromosome. The chimpanzee Y chromosome and human Y chromosome are like 70%. And there's some size difference as well. So it's less than 70% similar. So if our closest common ancestor is the chimpanzee, why is it nothing, nothing like the human Y chromosome? But the human Y chromosome, boom, goes back just um, 4,500 years. And Dr. Jensen said, okay, if this is true, there must be genetic signatures and markers in our Y chromosome, genetic stamps that can give us clues into the history of humanity. And boom, he's got like a 25 part series, highly technical. I, I can send that to you as well, where he's discovering all of these genetic signatures, migration patterns, um, things that should not be found if deep time evolution was true. Because remember the last 4,500 years, according to deep time evolution and the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA, that's just like the, the, the end, the tip of a needle of a long, long history. Those signatures shouldn't be there. It should just be a scrambled mess. So that's what I mean by genetics. You know, genetics is really, really, um, in my opinion, winning the war for, um, for creations. Of course, you can comment on anything that I just said there, Snake. And then if you'd like to just move on to another question you had, I think regarding the fossil record, go ahead. Go ahead. Take your time. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm more familiar with the Y chromosome stuff. And I, I've read a few things on uh, uh, pedigree based mitochondrial mutation rates and uh, but I, I really wanted to to read the Jensen stuff first um, what about before that? I make a final comment on that. But as for like, though, but, Y chromosome, yeah, it is it is more unstable, and uh, right. uh, there's a bunch of research. Well, first of all, like if it wasn't unstable, then we wouldn't we would expect that to be the least common between the chimps and the humans. And then secondly, there is uh, research on I think mole rats uh, or some kind of rodent that is basically their Y chromosome is degraded almost completely. And what's happening is they're forming a different, a new chromosome. Is that, so, is that in the lab, that one? Uh, that's, that's just observing the, the uh, genetics of the actual right. animals. In, in those animals, like what was it that degraded to near extinction? A mouse you said? No, the Y chromosome in the, I think it was like a mole rat or something like that. Okay, like this was in the wild or was it like in a lab experiment? It's just measuring wild ones. Wild ones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the point so, is with, with what they're finding is the Y chromosome does mutate a lot faster. Because the thing is evolutionists used to point, like there's one guy, Evo Grad, Rational Mind, he said... Uh, regarding replacing Darwin, he says it's like Jensen just ignores the Y chromosome. You know, he says nothing about it because the amount of DNA differences in the Y chromosome disproves young Earth creation. He says, but based on you know some of the newest studies and um, high quality Y chromosomal uh, DNA sequences, it's it's now known that the Y chromosome changes a lot faster than we thought. Therefore, um, the results. And Dr. Jensen's put out uh, recently a, a study, a peer-reviewed study in AIG, which I know you wouldn't agree with, but I'll send it to you anyway to see what your thoughts are. He, he demonstrated that the amount of DNA differences in the Y chromosome that exist in humans 
or only about 4,500 years worth of mutation accumulation. Now, here's the thing. If evolution was true, um, now we do know that Y chromosome is, I wouldn't say it's entirely the most unstable because it is for the most part immune to recombination right? Because it doesn't have a counterpart to exchange its genetic material with. Therefore, scrambling purposes, it's it's stable in a way where we should be able to look at the sequences themselves and look at um, markers, genetic markers, for example, which is what Jensen's doing, and seeing if he can detect historical signatures in, in the Y chromosome, which is, which is what he's doing. So in, in, in that case, it's, it's, it's stable. It's, it's immune to recombination. But according to the evolutionary model, if humans and chimps split nearly 6 million years ago, let's say, they would have had identical Y chromosomes at the split. Now, let's say the chimp line, okay, their Y chromosome was mutating fast. The human Y chromosome was mutating fast. Now we're here 6 million years later. So why was the chimp, um, the patterns and the um, history, population history of chimps, so much different to humans that it still resulted in a um, Y chromosomal sequence difference of like less than 70% because that would have to be some really, really significantly different environmental histories, wouldn't you say? Of course, humans would have been in a much different environment than chimps. They would have uh, much different uh, selection pressures. And we did, if there's a small difference in just 4,500 years, then there's going to be a large difference in 6 million years. Um, here, here's the thing, though. For that explanation to be, like, I've heard that, um, I think it was Rational Mind himself that said, you know, why chromosome um, differences could be explained by uh, faster rates of gene conversion. But remember, you, you know what I'm going to say. What testable predictions can you make then? Right? What type of histories, what type of environmental conditions, when did the Y chromosome decay faster? When did, you know, when was it a little bit more stable, for example? I mean, anybody can just come up with these post hoc ad hoc rescue devices and, and stories and stuff, right? And, and you would agree, you know, you don't want to hear about what I believe. You want to hear about what's demonstrable, what's observable, what's testable. And that's why I'm saying, hey, listen, this is what the pedigree based studies indicate. Here's the predictions that flow from it evolutionists they're kind of on the defense when it comes to molecular clocks they're you know they're given reasons they're giving um, stories and rescue devices as far as i'm concerned but without the testable predictions to flow from from those explanations they're just they're just non-science bringing up a lot of points here, but you mentioned the ERVs in your opening. So I was curious if yeah. you were aware of, of the endogenous retroviruses and the uh, the functions that are associated with them. Take your time, take as much time as you need, David. Okay, one second, let me pull up my notes here. Um, da -da 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 -da. <clears throat> All right, where are my notes? Even before, because are, are you familiar with the fact that this so-called "quote unquote" uh, junk DNA, David, it can actually modify the modify the way chromosomes, right, the packages of, of DNA are organized, thus changing the way the DNA functions. So, you know, this this prediction of of created heterozygosity based on genome functionality, the trajectory is very very strong for um, genome wide functionality. I'm just fascinated by the endogenous retroviruses and yeah, other I think, of these. I think your views are fascinating. And yeah, I am aware that there, that there are some um, quote unquote function to it, but I think that it doesn't really matter in the long run if there are um, endogenous retroviruses or retroviruses that have to be inserted into the cell um, that gets passed down. I still think that's um, solid evidence of um, that the um, <clears throat> the ERV got passed down through um, evolution and um, common descent. 
Well, it, 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 here's the thing, though. It, it's not just a few of these ERVs that are functional. Literally, these endogenous retroviruses, they have crucial functions in um, helping to regulate genes and even determine cell types. So um, a lot of the evolutionists, I've debated a biologist, you know, they'll claim that the, the functions were actually co-opted. Um, but is there any real evidence for that, uh, David? Like my question that I asked you in my opening was this. We know that ERVs and other classes of these retrotransposons accomplish many crucial functions in regulating gene expression, differentiation, development, for example. How do you fit that into the evolutionary story? Because evolutionists have always assumed that these were non-functional um, leftover remnants of ancient viral infections. But ancient viral infections don't become suddenly important in the placenta or in um, you know acting as DNA regulatory elements. Because we would say, and you probably got this from my opening, we would say that these ERVs, the pseudogenes, for example, these are all created DNA units of function, right? So how do, how do you fit um, the, da the data, the most updated data on these uh, DNA elements? How do you fit that into your evolutionary um, story? And, and take your time, David. All right, sure. So um, can you, um, I think it'll be helpful to um, point out a few of these um, sources that you um, <coughs> brought up and um, actually read the, allow me to take some time to read the whole paper. I, I, I could share a screen if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Um, please do. That'll be perfect. I'll, I'll, as you're answering the question, I'll share screen on the on the papers of the endogenous retroviruses. But I and what, what's as I'm bringing it up, what's fascinating as well, David, is that um, there's various classes of these retrotransposons found in in mice and. Um, when they're when they're turned off, for example, like the embryo, the the, the mouse stops developing. That that's how literally that that's how important these classes of retrotransposons are in our um, in in our genetics. So if you can see, I'm sharing screen. I'm not sure if you guys can see, but there's some papers here, uh, retroviral promoters in the here, human genome. Here we um, go. Um, let's see here. Um, in Johnson, uh, here we go. Um, right here, uh, and, regulatory activities of transposable elements. Right, right here in the right. abstract, it, it says transposable elements are a prolific source of tightly regulated biochemically active non-coding elements, such as transcription uh, factor binding sites and non-coding RNAs. Like we just know that the non-coding uh, regions of our DNA, they're um, in incredibly important to the rest of our genome. It's like they, they function much like the operating system in, in a computer, right, David? They're directing the timing, the expression and regulation and, and use of, of the other parts of the, um, of the genome. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just fascinating and it's exactly what um, we've always predicted as compared to evolutionists that would say that, you know, our genome is full of uh, ancient viral infections, leftovers of ancient viral infections or genetic mistakes, for example. But yeah, oh, it, it, so if you're looking at these papers here, how would you fit this, um, how would you fit this information into your, um, I guess the evolutionary story? Like for example, this one, I don't know if you can see science news. Scientists, well, I think almost like you. Hang on one second, standing. Uh, uh, David, are you with us right now? Uh, it looks like he got disconnected. Uh, pr uh, if you could, on your side, um, connect him back up. All right, looks like we got him back now. All right, let's um, because yeah. I'm getting some, I'm getting a, co a lot of comments uh, saying like uh, we want to see David uh, go through some of these. Um, so maybe we'll just give him a couple minutes to try and uh, give his side on some of these questions. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave these papers up. And, and like I said before many times, David, just take your time. Yeah, I know I've thrown a lot of information and questions at you. Take as much time as you need. I'll just sit back and um, you can take your time in answering these um, these challenges and questions. Go ahead, David. All right, sure. So the first thing uh, that I'm just going to do is just read the paper. Yeah, if you if like if you want to read the whole papers, I can send them to you afterwards, just to avoid dead air. But I yeah. mean, you can, you yeah, can see like them all here. I just like having a whole time to actually just read the whole um, paper. Like the, this one's fascinating. Intronic ALUs influence alternative splicing, even redundancy in, in our genome. You know, that's based yeah. on amazing design. How how would evolution? Because natural selection sees that which is 
uh, short term. We get redundancy, you know, for example, these redundant elements that help slow and speed processes in the cell. How does evolution uh, build or evolve, uh, you know, something like a spare tire? You know what I mean? These redundant uh, elements would require foresight. How does evolution ex account for that, those types of uh, um, functions in the genome, David? Well, first, let me um, just finish this up real quick. Um, reading, um, just glancing at the paper. Uh, right now, I'm just kind of uh, kind of taking a step back, We're looking at the paper, regulatory activities of transposable elements from complex of benefits that you cited. Um, I'm just going to do a quick search. All right. While he's doing that, I just want to say to everybody that's out there, maybe you've got a really interesting question or a really good um, stinger that you want to get one of them with. Uh, just uh, tag at Modern Day Debate or send in a super chat and get it pushed to the top of the list. Um, and uh, David, you can start back whenever you get your place. All right. Just trying to find my place real quick. Just give me a minute. Oh, it looks like the one I got is the redundancy of the genetic code that enables translational pausing. Yeah, the, I mean, there's there's so many papers coming out left and right uh, regarding function in, in our DNA. It's almost hard to um, stay updated on it, but that's what's so fascinating about the creation model is so many of our predictions are coming true more and more um, every single day. Uh, I, I, you know, like, are you looking to just read the whole papers or, you know, like you can see the, yeah, I, I personally like to just sit down and read the whole paper. Um, just oh, so yeah, I yeah, we can do it. Understanding. That's what I like to do. Um, first thing to do is just read the whole paper. Uh, this one is really long. Right, so it's maybe, so, yeah, so maybe. Yeah, why don't we exchange papers after the debate? Then? Yeah, and, and so why don't we, we get, why don't we, uh, yeah, we, yeah, we I set think that aside helpful. for now until you've read it, and maybe we'll move on to another salient point. Yeah, I think what we might do is just let me have a chance to read the whole papers that you're citing and come back for a part two of the debate. Would that be um, okay with you? Of course, of course. And Ed, when you read the paper, I want you to um, jot down, you know, how they explain, whether it's through co-option, for example, how they explain these functions. And, and let me know and ask yourself too, is, is this philosophy or is this based on observable evidence? For example, I debated conspiracy cats recently who specializes in endogenous retroviruses. And we spent probably an hour discussing this. And I asked them, I said, you know, do you have any technical paper, any real empirical data that can show us a non-functional endogenous retrovirus going from non-functional to something extremely functional in, in in the genome. I mean, I want you to consider the fact that these classes of retrotransposons, as I talked about, David, that are found in the mouse embryo, that if you deactivate it, the mouse embryo will develop and then stop. Well, why? Because it depends on the function of these retrotransposons, which evolutionists have always assumed was junk. Now, the patterns, the nested hierarchical patterns, that's also predicted uh, based on the design model. Of course, we're going to share more in physiology, anatomy, and morphology with a chimp than we will with an old world monkey or than we will with a fish, for example, right? Those nested patterns are predicted on both sides. But the one key factor that can differentiate between the two models is DNA function. And DNA function is on the side of the creationist. Um, if you wanted to move to... Um, and, and For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Just on this question, but the hypermutation would have a big effect on, let's say, your mitochondrial DNA, your Y chromosome, because those are uni parentally inherited DNA, as we would agree. The mitochondrial DNA, we, we inherit almost exclusively from our mothers, Y chromosome from our fathers. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with that. The biparentally inherited DNA, though, as we were talking about earlier, which is the nuclear DNA, recombined, for example, created heterozygosity would now apply. As, I, as me and Walker were talking about earlier, Neanderthals would have had millions of created differences. What this means is the corresponding increase due to the hypermutation would be virtually undetectable in the nuclear DNA because, because of the uh, incredible amount of inbreeding. But by far, Speed, the greatest impact would be 
as I said, due to the levels of inbreeding. That means it's entirely plausible to have biparentally inherited DNA be less diverse, which we agreed with. We spent most of the, the debate on that, but we agreed with it. And yet the less diverse than modern humans, we should say, say let's be correct. But the uniparentally inherited DNA to be more diverse, which is the mitochondrial DNA, which is where we need the hypermutation to have the most significant impact because that's where the DNA differences are that cannot be attributed to created heterozygosity and that are corresponding to the most recent common ancestor of modern uh, people groups. So what are your thoughts on that? Go ahead. Well, okay, so you said that they would have been front-loaded with uh, allelic diversity and stuff like that. In the but we, DNA, yeah. Yeah, in the nuclear DNA. But we still have DNA samples from Homo sapiens from that time period, right? And we still don't see them as an in-group. Um, right, and that's a problem. Yeah, and, and another thing is... Yeah, but you're looking at so, created heterozygosity. So you're looking at nuclear DNA markers. Because cause now we're talking about the mitochondrial... So are you saying the mitochondrial DNA... Because I want to know why you believe that the hypermutation is inconsistent. I, I get what you're saying about the, the phylogeny, the phylogenetics, where they... Yeah, well, that was right a separate you, point, but yeah. Yeah, so, so just the hypermutation. Why do you believe that they are inconsistent with each other? Because, as I said, the inbreeding would be your greatest effect in the nuclear DNA. Okay. And the hypermutation would be almost undetectable. But yet the mitochondrial DNA, which is only 16,000 letters long, this is where there would be the most significant impact. And therefore, both can be consistent. Yes, you have hypermutation in the whole genome, of course. Of course, mm -hmm. you have hypermutation in the whole genome. But the nuclear DNA, the size of it, the recombination that occurs in it, combined with our position of created heterozygosity, those mutations would be virtually undetectable. But not undetectable in the mitochondrial DNA. So that's how they both can... Dr. Dan says they're, they, they have to be mutually exclusive, when in fact that's not the case. And I'm glad that we ended up agreeing that the inbreeding is um, is observed. But yeah. now we have to go into the mitochondrial DNA, and that's where the hypermutation is going to have the most significant impact. the work that we're doing here on standing for truth please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started i'm sorry to get away from their questions but i wondered about this so what about the numbers of the people like do you think it really don't 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 creation say it like doubled and doubled or something like that yeah i i mean if you actually take back the number of people we have today um once you start going back far enough it's really hard to track genealogies because then we're all so closely related. For example, there's been so much intermixing, interbreeding, but the population growth rate really does just go back to 4,500 years. Evolutionists oftentimes have to invoke extinction events or plagues or other types of factors to account for their date of 200,000 years for the out of Africa. But yeah, the population fits quite nicely with the young earth creation timescale. What about those extinction events in the creationist mode? Yeah, there would have been, well, for example, there would have been a near extinction event with the flood. That would have been a population bottleneck. The creation model has essentially three bottlenecks. you got a bottleneck at creation with Adam and Eve, a bottleneck at the flood with eight people, and then a brief bottleneck at Babel. The, um, the thing with the creation model bottlenecks, though, is they were all one generation, and they were followed by rapid and exponential population growth. Therefore, there wouldn't be any inbreeding problems. There wouldn't be any significant loss of that original created heterozygosity. Now, if you get into the evolutionary population bottleneck, which was extended for over a thousand years 
um, within a population of two to 10,000. Now there would have been some significant e inbreeding problems, which would result in rapid genetic degeneration. So bottlenecks and extinction events are a problem for um, the evolutionists. And, and unfortunately, Katz and I didn't get to discuss that too much, but I did discuss it in my opening. Mm -hmm. So good yeah. question. Kath, do you have anything you want to say about it? Uh, no, I, mean, I think when we, you know, we talk about inbreeding, I, I don't understand how how you can you can address a bottleneck and say that's going to cause inbreeding problems when you claim that you've got three people stepping off the ark and, and producing an entire population. You know, um, I think if we're going to talk about inbreeding, that's going to happen because, like I said before, just it, it's, it's totally impossible for the, a small number of people stepping off one boat to have all of the variation, all the alleles needed for the variation today. Uh, and if they did start to breed, the inbreeding would be more severe than anything we've seen uh, anywhere. But then it only takes one bacterial cell, you know, to, to produce uh, an entire uh, colony. So, you know, who knows? But how, how, how much variation is there in that colony? Not a great deal. Um, and of course, they, they reproduce by a different, different method anyway. So I don't know why I'm waffling on about that now. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's nonsense. The you know the inbreeding that will be caused by two or three people stepping off an arc is is ridiculous. Well, I, uh, just to respond to that real quick, I guess because it is an interesting point that you made. I do want to emphasize that according to our model, the seven billion people on the planet today descend from ultimately three founding couples: Noah's three um, daughters-in-law and Noah's three sons. For example, fascinatingly, we see three main mitochondrial DNA lines around the globe on every single continent, L, M, and N. So that evolutionists will just say that's a um, that's a coincidence, but it's it's fascinating uh, confirmation of that model, but that that's more than possible because we don't explain the vast majority of DNA differences as a result of mutations. And I feel like I got to say that over and over again. We explain the vast majority of DNA differences as a result of created heterozygosity. That means there would be no inbreeding problem because evolutionists explain the vast majority of DNA differences as the result of mutations. So by the time you reach the out of Africa scenario, you've got the Australopithecines evolving into Homo erectus. Homo erectus evolves into Homo sapiens, sapiens, for example, or Homo sapiens. There's been so many generations of mutation accumulation that by the time you reach that bottleneck, now you've got all these recessive mutations that are coming to the forefront, leading to rapid genetic degeneration. But inbreeding is the uh, exposing of the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes. In the creation model, up to the flood, there wouldn't be any accumulation. There'd be a few, but very little accumulation of genetic mutations and genetic mistakes. So if there's no mistakes to, um, to lead to a significant inbreeding problem, there wouldn't be an inbreeding problem like there would be with the evolutionary bottleneck. But if those DNA differences are front loaded from the start, then therefore processes like recombination, gene conversion, shuffle around those DNA differences could produce variety rapidly, even in a single generation that goes for the archives as well. So it's, uh, but it's, it's a model that leads to testable predictions and that's what needs to be addressed is the prediction. Of the yeah, whole that's, 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 I will, and, and I know this is a question thing. I'll just say one thing on that and then I'll, I'll leave it. You know, it, back in sort of like, you know, testable prediction, where, where do we see in breeding? You know, we look at selective breeding, don't we? We look at selective breeding, which is what humans and, and, and uh, farmers have been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years. And with selective breeding, uh, which is a form of inbreeding, we breed out. We breed out the variation and we get similar. We don't breed in variation. We don't have seven people step off an arc, inbreed and create variation. Selective breeding where we, we have, you know, we have a, a, a small number of organisms and we are breeding them together. It, it reduces variation over time. So it's not just about accumulated mutations, which can then come to the front. It's about a reduction in variation, uh, going out and meeting other people who've got, who are very different to you. And it, that, that's how variation is, is spread as well as mutation. Inbreeding will reduce it. That's actually a good point because... Um, as creationists, since we believe in the created heterozygosity hypothesis, we look back to the creation event and we see the expansion of the genome because these changes, these speciation events have resulted from shifts in heterozygosity to homozygosity, which means uh, sh uh, reduction in, in variation. That's why when we look to species today, for example, we can look at the seven living equid species. They have more homogeneous gene sites than they do heterozygous, which makes sense according to our model because um, we're looking at reduction in uh, genetic variation. You can see that with two wolves. You can see that with dog breeding. For example, uh, two chihuahuas are not going to have very much 
allelic uh, variation. They're not going to have much genetic potential. And what I find funny, and this will be my last point, is like I said, with the, with the equid species, you're, you've got um, seven altogether. I believe it's three species of zebra, one wild horse species, three wild asses. Now, when it comes to the breeds, we've got over 850 breeds of horses and donkeys in the world today. And the evolutionists will even admit that these breeds have come about through in human history because they've been created through the recombination, for example, shuffling around those DNA differences, resulting in new variation. This has been done by humans. Now, evolutionists will say that those seven little itty, itty bitty species of equids took, I believe it's um, four million years for those seven to come about, but they will even agree that it only took thousands of years for the 700 plus breeds to come about, but then they think there's a huge problem. Oh, okay. I have, a, I wanted to ask another question to somebody, a few people have asked about this, um, about, it's a study that I, they want to know if you've seen it, um, standing for truth. The of course, 20, yeah. 2017 UF study, snail kite bird evolves virtually overnight to keep up with invasive prey in Gainesville, Florida. Have you seen that? It's speciated literally overnight is what it said? Um, it's virtually it evolved virtually overnight. I don't know the study, so I don't know what it says. It, it's very interesting because right? we've, got, we've got future testable predictions on speciation rates. We look at, for example, there's only about 10 to 12,000 bird species. We take that back 4,500 years to the flood. That's roughly two to four new bird species a year. Therefore, we should be expecting to see observed um, new species of bird in real time. And just last year, it was um, a paper came out where there's been a new species of Darwin finches on the Galapagos Islands in real time. And what's funny is the speciation event uh, resulted from shifts from heterozygosity to homozygosity just has been predicted based on this created heterozygosity hypothesis. So what I find funny, and, and if Katz wants to respond, he can, evolution yeah. would say that birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs roughly 65 million years ago. Right. Why are there so few bird species today? 10 to 12,000 species. This also goes for lizard species, uh, snake species. There's only a few thousand species um, per um, like creature, for example. So uh, yeah, go ahead. You can have a word there if you want to cast. Well, just, just on speciation, uh, I know you were talking about birds and I know insects didn't go on the ark, um, but there are millions, and, and I presented this argument to Kent Hovind, there are millions and millions of species of insect and we will be needing, uh, you know, I think I calculate, what I forgot my slide here, three or four new species of insect a week um Ugh. Ugh. You know, so we so yeah you, you know you might be able to find one species that fits but and that's based on six thousand years and that was just using uh flies wasps please bees uh be kind because i included bees and wasps to get um and aphids you know that was just using those as an example in the calculation which i, I can put in a video if you want but yeah when we look at insects um you know yeah we, we we're, we're looking at almost on a daily basis we should be seeing new new uh insects which we just don't see so yeah the speciation rate is well, way too high. how come there's so few bird species like i said uh, if if uh birds evolved from theropod like dinosaurs yeah. 65 million years ago why do the number of bird species between 10 and 12,000 correlate so well with the young earth creation two time? words extinction rate right i knew you're going to say that what kind of predictions can you make on ext extinction events? How many extinction events? How how fast are these speciation rates? We've observed in real time last year a new species of bird. The number of species, insects, there's only a, a one million species of insects. That includes everything that you've you've explained. Insects survive a flood, no problem. Insects Do they? Can how? insects can just make their way onto the ark, no problem. That's easy. But when it comes to yeah. like mammals, reptiles, and birds, I'm talking here. Relax. Don't, don't interrupt. Don't interrupt. Don't interrupt. 34,000 species. For example, lizards and snakes. I don't have the exact data here. Um, there's only about, um, for bats, there's 1,100 species. Lizards, I believe there's 4,000. Snakes, there's about 4,000. That's one new species per year. The species that we see, do not correlate with deep time evolution. They correlate much better with 
Young Earth Creation Time School. And Anthony here just proved his non-science and his post hoc ad hoc ridiculous rescue devices because you oh extinction events. Show me some testable predictions on on extinction events that though, or this just non-science and rescue device. Go ahead. Right. I mean, look, at the end of the day, you've picked a species or you picked a bird, and that seems to fit your thing. Ultimately, it just doesn't. I mean, I, I presented this argument in a 20-minute part of my debate with Ken Hovind. And, you know, there's more. I could talk about rabbits. I could talk about oh, rabbit kind, beetle kind. We need How a new species of rabbit every week. Uh, species of rabbit. So let me just go back there. Um, <laughs> now, that depends whether you want to talk about rabbit or rabbit and her kind. We need to see a new species of uh, rabbit uh, every two years. And we need to see... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Are species. Say that again, sorry. Is that a combination of species and breeds or just species? Really, we're talking about species, actual different species, not not breeds and species. Okay, and that's, I, I, don't I, I, looked up, I looked up your slide after, and you accidentally included breeds in your in your with rabbit species. Once again, there's only a few that correlate nicely with the young Earth creation timescale. You can't include that. Would be like me including the equid species, the living seven in the wild, with the 850 breeds. Breeds are easy to come about. Humans do it naturally. You got to look at that that which is in the wild, cat. So you might. How do you define that. a breed? How do you define a uh, because when I'm talking about, uh, yeah, go on, how do you define the breed? Definitely breed about right. through artificial selective means from humans. That, so obviously they came about during human history. So the rabbit species in the wild, there's only a few. There's only a few species of rabbits. There's only a few species of birds, lizards, snakes. Every animal you can point to fits well with creation. Uh, Wait a minute. You, are you saying, excuse me. I'm sorry. Yes, I, I'm sorry. trying to follow. I'm just trying to follow, babe. So are you saying that humans make breeds of everything like are we what so by definition breed versus species okay there's a difference between like your um canis coyotes canis familiaris you know all your different species of dogs versus your 450 breeds the breeds have been artificially okay selected from humans they've done the job that's you know, just through sh reshuffling of these genetic DNA differences, right. the species in the wild, those are the ones that we need to explain how they came from the flood. Right. I thought and you were talking about every animal, not just dogs. It wouldn't make any sense when you're saying, oh, you need over 300 rabbit species. No, because most of those are breeds. Those came about from human means anyways. You add to that because you, you talk about kinds coming off the arc. So it wouldn't just be the rabbits. It will be the rabbits and her because that will be the same right. kind as defined by Kent Hobin. And then if you talk about kind, you add the peaker to that as well. And that's what I was doing. You know, so unless you want to talk about rabbits as being one animal, hers being another, peaker being another, in which case they are all on the arc together. And if we start doing that with animals, then suddenly the, the arc becomes too full because no ship can carry them. In 2014, a group of master students at Leicester University decided to settle the question. They used the biblical measurements to calculate the size of the arc. Then they used the density of the water to figure buoyancy, and from there, determined how much weight the ship could endure before sinking. Their conclusion? Noah could have put 70,000 animals on board and the ship would have floated. And what do you know? It floats! So... It, well, we're talking about the speciation from a kind, in which case the speciation rate is unbelievable. Or are we talking about speciation from all the animals we've got anyway, you know, um, which means, you, do you know what I mean? Like, which means well, the, the when it comes to, by rule, by definition, species and breeds, there's always more. There might be a few um, cases, but, you know, the majority proves the rule. There's always more breeds than there is species. The species are very limited. Now, when you look to this idea, it's very simple. When you look to this idea of pre-existing diversity, okay? So, for example, let's take the cat ancestor aboard the ark. There's only about 37 cat species in the wild, okay? So, say that this cat ancestor was front-loaded with a whole bunch of functional DNA differences at creation. Now, these front-loaded functional DNA differences has led to the origin of species. For example, you've, Noah brings two cats. Now we've got everything from tigers to house cats to jaguars and in between. If you look to dogs, same thing applies. You've got everything from wolves to coyotes to jackals and foxes. Kind, and you're, talking about the cat, you, you're not talking about taking species on there. You're talking about taking kinds on the Right. So, so Noah yeah. would have taken, let's say Noah took two bears. 
Now that those bears would have originally been front loaded with all these functional DNA differences, it's led oh, yeah. to the origin of species. Now we have black bears, brown bears, polar bears. And as a matter of fact, all eight species of bear, like eight species hey, bear. of bear is not hard to explain, yeah. is my point. What I'm saying, if you take kinds on the arc, then the speciation rate has to shoot up rather than taking species. And uh, I mean, again, it's something maybe I'll put in another video, but uh, you know, I will politely say that you are just massively wrong with that the speciation rate if you're taking kinds is way way i mean there are 350,000 different species of beetle alone now that means that we need one species of beetle you can go to insects and avoiding mammals and reptiles and amphibians why is there only eight species of bear why is there only 37 species of cats all right but your model should have to fit to every single organism you just like 350,000 species of beetle and we took one kind on the ark then, and I'm just looking at my slide now that I used, that calculated over 6,000 years if we didn't put them on the ark because they're an insect, we need a new species of beetle every single week. And we're, and, and we're not getting new species. Bees only live, so when bees live a few months, a queen lays thousands upon thousands of eggs. There's only a million species of insects. Like I said, they can survive a flood easily. They can survive on log mats. They can survive in the ark just by going there on accident. When we focus on the 34,000 mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, there's so few for deep time evolution to be true. That's why just like Anthony uh, proved to us here, you have to result to a, a, a rescue device of extinction events. No, all we do is linear speciation events since uh, the flood 4,500 years ago, easily explains the number of bird species, reptile species, mammal species. I just showed that it's consistent with your cat species, your bear species, your dog species. We're the ones making the predictions. Evolutionists can't. point of accumulating mutations, we can take that back in time to what's called a point of least accumulating mutations where there is no mutations, no genetic mistakes, just those pre-existing functional created differences by God. That is what we mean by a perfect genome, free of genetic mistakes. Hmm. So like regarding any, so free of any mistake, um, so what exactly would like a perfect genome like what exactly would that be like like at a it, like a face level if, if or at like a uh that doesn't even make sense what i just asked um <laughs> that's okay <laughs> yeah but like what exactly would like a person how what would that person look like with a perfect genome or a perfect a good question. So um, there's a number of ways we can go back to the original created um, genome. And um, we're doing it through, like, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, are you, I, I know you're familiar with human chromosomes, but are you familiar with the fact that they're made up of relatively large linkage blocks? A linkage block? Right. It would just be like, um, because these linkage blocks would consist of nucleotides. It can be thousands of nucleotides within the chromosomes. Mm -hmm. And when we an uh, analyze these original text strings, it looks like, especially in the human genome, that because they exist, so every generation we experience recombination, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, th that's why we look different. You know, um, me and my wife would produce our daughter and recombination would take place, kind of like shuffling a deck of cards. There's something called gene conversion as well. So over time, these processes, these genetic processes, they scramble up the chromosomes. They scramble up the linkage blocks. Um, so if deep time evolution was true, let's say we evolved from Homo erectus um, 200,000 years ago, somewhere in Africa. And then before that, Homo erectus was evolving for millions of years. And before that, you have the Australopithecines. Well, that amount of time should scramble, especially if recombination and gene conversion are happening nearly every single generation. It should scramble our genome to randomness. There should be almost no linkage blocks seen. But the fact that we see so many of these linkage blocks, you can see this in what's called the hat map data. Um, tells us that our genome is young. So what's fascinating is because these linkage blocks exist, 
um, creation scientists like Robert Carter, John Sanford, they are tracing these blocks right back to the original blocks, the original text strings. And that would technically be an answer to your question is what did this original perfect um, created genome look like? Because remember, remember, if these DNA differences were front loaded into Adam and Eve at creation, well, it's funny because opponents of Adam and Eve, and I just did a response to Godless Engineer, they'll say, hey, listen, it's impossible. Adam and Eve couldn't have existed. Um, Biologos will say this. There's just too much diversity in just 6,000 years from two people, Adam and Eve. Well, for one, that assumes that all diversity is the result of mutation. All those nuclear DNA differences, evolutionists say were um, due to deep time evolution. But we're saying that, no, 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 most of these DNA differences were front loaded into Adam and Eve because God said, be fruitful and multiply. Did he mean for that to be carried out through cloning? It wouldn't make any sense for God to not front load Adam and Eve with, with DNA differences. So we can actually now look at the DNA differences around the globe. We can look at those alleles that are geographically specific and more rare. So we can say, okay, those are obviously um, mutations after Babel because they're geographically specific. But the ones that are more so common and not disease causing and functional and important, those are the ones that we can safely say, okay, those are the ones that were initially created at creation. So just take away all those mutations, those rare alleles that we find. I think there's about, um, 65 million maybe worldwide. Um, I mean, they're still doing genomic testings and analyses, but take those away, take the common variants, because you and I, we've got about three to four million places, more or less, um, in our that we got from our mother and our father that actually differs from each other within our own genome. So take the ones around the world, throw that into Adam and Eve and boom. So I know a lot of this is technical, but your question was kind of a tough question to answer, but right, right. Short answer, you, you've done an awesome job working on it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you, you've done an awesome job answering it. So yeah, thank you so much for being so darn good doing that. <laughs> <laughs>
African people groups, for example, the Khoisan peoples, and he said, I'll show you how accurate the mutation rate is showing that Eve lived just thousands of years ago. I predict the mutation rate in these Khoisan peoples. And he said, he said, evolutionists can do the same thing. And they admitted there's a four hour debate between him and an evolutionist. He admitted that's a, that's a tough thing to do. But he made that direct prediction that only future observations can tell us if it's true or not. So I challenge the evolutionists to go make those uh, those same predictions. And that's just a few of probably the hundreds I can go over. So really good question. Wow. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, great question, great answer. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. So a bunch of creationists back in 2005 and a little bit earlier decided that they were going to disprove radiometric dating and they couldn't. They had to admit that a young Earth position cannot be reconciled with the scientific data without assuming that exotic solutions will be discovered in the future. No known thermodynamic process could account for the required rate of heat removal, nor is there any known way to protect organisms from radiation damage. As far as uh, speeding up the de decay rate, I've given a few examples with fission tracks and radio halos and, for example, uh, helium in my opening. But according to a catastrophic plate tectonics model, the CPT meters per second plate movement would produce new oceanic crust, replacing the old one. This new oceanic crust would show the same age through isochron dating since it formed all at the same time. Uh, I wanted to address real quick, I believe she said, um, how would we explain away the heat? Yeah, a lot of heat would be would be generated, but the massive amount of water that was on the earth at the time based on the flood would shield NOAA. And the rate project explains this. So they do have answers and it would also shield the animals on the earth. If you have a mile or more of water, of course, we even use water as air probably knows in a nuclear reactor to protect and to shield things. So this would not only shield from radiation, but it would also take up much of the heat. There's also a ton of evidence that at the breaking up of the fountains of the Great Deep, there would have involved supersonic steam jets that would have uh, taken up most of the heat up into space and more. What do you mean? What do you mean by genetic entropy exactly? So, so good question. So it's the fact that well, we've gone over genetically um, why our genome is more and more data, more more and more accumulating papers is suggesting that the genome is uh, near fully functional. Like there's there's a project called the Encode Project. They they um, it's a secular project. They reveal that over 80% of the genome is actively transcribed in RNA suggesting function. Now that's biochemical. So we don't know what every single gene, every single RNA is doing, but um, we know that there's activity there. And why would the cell uh, transcribe all this junk? It would just be a, a waste of resources and energy. So we know that there's activity there now. Well, we're actually, creation scientists are making predictions that, hey, you, you knock out these genes, for example, um, and they're going to have this function or this function. So there's a lot of predictions coming from our side on DNA function. But the evolutionists assume the majority is junk, so they can't really make those predictions, unfortunately. Uh, but genetic entropy would suggest, okay, so our nuclear, um, we have our somatic cells, germ, um, germ cell lines, um, germ cell lines. Reproductively, we pass on about 100 new mutations per person per generation, okay? So those accumulate, but gets, but the thing is natural selection, only acts upon the most detrimental of mutations, boom, gets gets rid of it, right? And mm -hmm. acts upon the best beneficial mutations. Let's say sickle cell anemia, melanoprotein, whatever, you can name it. But it doesn't do anything against the nearly neutral mutations because they're invisible to se selection because those mutations, David, they only have a very subtle effect on phenotype and genotype. So genetic entropy would suggest, okay, kind of like a single spelling mistake in a book the size of an encyclopedia, one single spelling mistake on its own, it's inconsequential to the message, but the buildup 
and the accumulation of them over time will degrade the message and degrade the book. And that's what we see in our genetics. That's why man appears to be devolving. That's why there's um, like the genetic database of diseases is just growing every single year. It's entropic degeneration on, on every level. So the question for somebody who, let's say, disagrees with genetic entropy and the fact that man is presently devolving, the question would be, and the question I would have for you if you disagree with that is, what type of selection could rid the population of so many uh, mutations that are just pouring into our genetics that natural selection can't even see? They're essentially invisible. Um, yeah, go ahead. What are your thoughts on that? So when you say we're devolving, do you, are you like saying that like we're becoming more susceptible like to diseases or something like that? Or Yeah, good question. I'm just saying that we are accumulating. According to our model, God created us perfect, perfect genomes. He created us not to reproduce by cloning. What do you mean by that? Like... Um, so uh, we know that mutations are typographical errors in a text. You know, we accumulate, each gene has a different mutation rate. Mitochondrial DNA is going to mutate differently than the nuclear DNA. But the ones that are passed on generally in nuclear DNA and our germ cell lines is about 100 new mutations per person per generation. So mutations we now know are generally destructive. They're either nearly neutral or um or, or detrimental, and even the ones that are beneficial, like sickle cell anemia, they're still reductive in nature. There's a benefit and an adaptation to be right. had, but it's typically due to like a broken gene, broken protein. So genetic entropy just says, hey, listen, things are breaking down, species are going extinct, genetic mistakes are accumulating. If you take David, according to our model, it makes sense, fits perfectly. We can take this point right now, this point of, of genetic entropy, this point of accumulating mutations, we can take that back in time to what's called a point of least accumulating mutations where there is no mutations, no genetic mistakes, just those pre-existing functional created differences by God. That is what we mean by a perfect genome, free of genetic mistakes. Hmm. The specific prediction that Dr. Jensen has made regarding the patterns found in the biological world. The one that you have been repeating previously? No, no, this right? is a diff no, no, different this is prediction. One of tell, us, tell us all about this prediction. Okay, well, if you're looking at those nested hierarchical patterns and we're trying to say that those patterns are there for functional purposes, well, are you familiar with these highly, highly conserved mitochondrial proteins like the cytochrome C? Yeah. Okay, so why why does, let's say, the CO1 gene, the cytochrome C, mitochondrial DNA protein, why, when you look at that um, genetically, why do they form nested hierarchical patterns? Why are there oh, so many different uh, It's variants? impossible for them not to in a natural branching speciation. Exactly. Isn't that, doesn't that appear to be um, confirmation or evidence for descent with modification? Because the human, yeah. all humans, how, how similar is the human and chimp cytochrome C mitochondrial DNA protein? Off the top of my head, I don't know. Well, it's very similar. And then the okay. further you go, you go to, you can go to the old world monkeys, you can go down to dogs, cats, okay. fish. Those and nested hierarchical being... patterns exist. So my question is, well, I guess if you don't know, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has made a prediction as to why those differences exist, differentiating between nested patterns from common descent and nested patterns from function. So are you familiar with uh, protein moonlighting, multifunctionality in these nuclear DNA proteins? Uh, I, the, the term is vaguely familiar, but I, I don't know right off the bat on it. I did, I did show a paper. So uh, um, mitochondrial proteins now have, it's kind of like a multifunctional tool they're, they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, they're involved in not just obviously protein related function, but information flow and uh, metabolic optimization, for example. So Dr. Nathaniel Jensen is making predictions that these highly conserved mitochondrial DNA proteins, such as the uh, cytochrome C that form these nested hierarchical patterns that seem to look like descent with mo modification. He's saying that those as well are multifunctional. Now, we don't have data to confirm this yet. Those tests haven't been done. So therefore, that is a novel prediction that can help us understand, is this descent with modification or are these patterns reflection, reflective of function? And I can send you that paper too. It's about 50 I would love to, just depth. make sure that I don't already have it in the data field. Uh, apparently, you're going to stick on the mitochondria a lot. I uh, hope that we no, can no, get to, just... to, to mammoths and the Native Americans and those too. No, I'm just showing you because you brought up the fact that creationists ignore the data field and you always talk about Todd Wood and Kurt Wise. Todd Wood looks at uh, morphology and anatomy and Dr. Nathaniel Jensen disagrees with that because like I said, 
Um, well, I don't want to repeat myself why bones are inconsistent. You can look to convergent evolution, for example. Oh, but you will. <laughs> so they look to molecular clocks and DNA function. That's why the ALUs you talk about or the ERVs, for example, the fact that they're highly functional DNA elements, that's um, that's certainly consistent with this model of, as, as you love to hear me say, created heterozygosity. When How do you can explain we expect that? Take priority, Buckaroo. <laughs> Go ahead. Next question. Next up, Terry James, thanks for your super chat, says creationism does not predict nested hierarchies. If nested hierarchies didn't exist, that would be used against evolution and for intelligent design. Right. So, um, for one, uh, Linnaeus, he's the father of taxonomy, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And he based his classification system on function. And we're predicting that these patterns that are found, um, they are there for functional reasons. And I gave very specific um, predictions on those highly conserved mitochondrial uh, DNA proteins. Like people like conspiracy cats or Herman Mays will say, why did God create so many variations of, you know, that same highly conserved uh, mitochondrial protein that does one function. And it's like, no, these, you know, we're predicting these are multifunctional, but of course we're going to predict more similarities in anatomy, morphology and genetics and physiology with a human and a chimp than a human and a fish. And we see, uh, we see the echo in the design realm with modes of transportation. So expectations on both sides, but here's the key. Here's the key predictions from our side, no predictions from the evolutionist side. Well, that's that's a claim that you're making, but I, I read the evolutionists and the, the field in there. And the point about nested hierarchies is, is that there is an inevitable discontinuity between the alleged kinds. And the problem is that whenever they try to look in the details, they have to start mugging up the boundary layers to avoid creating too many interconnected kinds. That was the problem that uh, Wood got into by including all the way back to Heracotherium on the horse sequence. And that very mechanism, if applied to the human holobaramin, puts up uh, 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 Australopithecus sediba in the human holobaramin, which Wise got a bunch of pushback on that one. Wise or Wood, whoever had done that. I think it was Wood that did the study on that. So uh, they're way behind the actual systematics in this area. And they've been that way for an awful long time. And I don't expect them ever to catch up. Gotcha. Was that super chat for me, James? Or? It was. That's why I'll give you a quick response. And then I've got to try to ask you guys as uh, hard as you, uh, if you can uh, exercise your uh, self-restraint as much as possible. I know you've already. <laughs> That'll you've always, require a miracle, you've, you've got James. got two talkers you've here, always got, You've always got a, another round in the chamber ready to fire. But I just to get through as many questions as possible. We'll give you one um, rebuttal, Sandy, for truth. Yeah, yeah, was real quick, 20 seconds, not even. Um, yeah, I, th I think James proved simply by me asking a question, how do you define species using uh, fossils? And it's very difficult. And of course, similarity doesn't always mean uh, ancestry. That's why they invoke convergent evolution. I can go on and on and on. But we, using DNA function and molecular clocks, for one, we've already separated uh, humans. I mean, humans' kinds are not related to anything else based on mitochondrial DNA, DNA function, and Y chromosome. We're doing that same thing and applying it to all the other species. Maybe RJ our next debate can be on species and not humans. Gotcha. Thanks mm. for your the completeness or lack thereof, or rather, sorry, functionality or lack thereof of any given genome. And and I don't want to go too far down ENCODE just because we talked about it so much last right. time. Um, but if you I want, did. You could... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say I did take your advice and I looked into what they the work that they were doing on those knockout tests because you, you posed a good question to me you said okay well if we know that most of the genome isn't functional and and in conventional geology encode non-withstanding usually what i have heard at least on in textbooks and things like that functionality means that it that it impacts phenotype um so sheer trans transcription outside of the realm of encode is not typically considered functional and so you asked me um we were talking about knockout tests for mice because I had said to you, well, you know, they do these big knockout tests in mice where what they do is they, they artificially go in for the audience's sake and they knock out a bunch of genes, pump, 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 pump like that. And then they see what happens, you know, can the mouse right. still reproduce? Um, and they do this usually um, in vitro. So it's like, can the mouse still reproduce? Does it have normal arms? Does it have a normal tail? And I looked into it and they managed to, the, the extent that they have gone to is they knock, they can knock out half the entire genome of the mouse and of the, the, what is considered the junk DNA. Um, right. And it's, it, it is still like running around doing its deal. Well, I, you know, I, so. and, and, yeah, and that's a good, I wasn't gonna point 
to um, function just yet. We could talk, I was going to point to something else as a way to draw the line, but since you did bring that up, yeah, I would say I do have a study here where what they did was they knocked out junk DNA of a mouse um, and you're right, there were some experiments where the uh, mouse offspring were just fine, but they've also done multiple experiments to see if they corroborate that. Um, but what they found was that I believe there was uh, some long non-coding RNA gene knockouts that actually showed uh, lethality that were associated with um, the development. I think it was tissues such as the lungs, the heart, the testes, even the brain, for example. Um, and even when they knock out certain uh, classes of retrotransposons in, in the mouse embryo, the mouse embryo, when it's uh, when that uh, jumping gene is turned on, the mouse suddenly dies, which shows the importance of uh, certain in various classes of uh, retrotransposons. But what I said in the previous debate as well was that many um, non-coding uh, RNA genes, even pseudogenes, are only expressed under certain conditions that are not, um, unfortunately, are not available in uh, lab type settings, but redundancy. I mean, even if you're seeing some genes that are knocked out and the mouse is just fine, I mean, redundancy is, is an amazing thing. I mean, it, it, in computer code, redundancy is highly beneficial. How does evolution explain um, redundancy, for example? Natural selection sees the long term. That's what or natural selection sees the short term. So how does natural selection help evolve something like uh, redundant uh, redundancy in, in the genome? Go ahead. Well, yeah, well, conceptually, and I don't know, I wouldn't, I would need to take some time to look into the technical papers on this, but I can answer you from a, from a, from a conceptual standpoint, sure, which is you're course. right. Natural selection works, works in the short term. In fact, there is nothing, um, there is no kind of, of gene that, that, you know, is partially really naturally selected. And I want to explain what I mean by that. Um, yeah, it's either, yeah, it's either bad and it's selected. It's kind of fickle, I suppose. Pose. But mm -hmm. I would encourage you to look into the concept of precursor mutations because I think they have quite a bit of bearing on co-option. They're certainly yeah. not the same thing, but essentially the idea of a precursor mutation is that um, you, you, you know, I, I can't remember who did it, but that there's one guy who has like this classic example of the mousetrap where he removes, you know, most of the parts of the mousetrap for it to be a functioning mousetrap. And he's like, it makes a really ugly tie clip. So the idea is that every single stage in, in the concept of precursor mutations, if you're trying to get a complex structure or behavior or length of, gene, of DNA, whatever, but every sort of subsequent step is useful in some way. You get what I'm saying? So right, this yeah. this is, and I know this has been done to to quite a bit of success with with um, uh, the flagella, but I don't know if it's been done with what you're talking about here. So I would love to look if into done, it. Yeah. I, I very much imagine it's going to be the same type of scenario. Sure. It, and I would love to look at those papers too, just to kind of go uh, down deep in it. You know what I mean? I want to see how much of it is empirical, how much of it is uh, philosophy, because I think for evolution accounting for you know DNA repair and the redundant mechanisms, for example, that we see in, in the genomes, those redundant mechanisms, as it looked like you agreed um, with, is it requires forward thinking when we know that natural selection works in, in the short term. So it's like th there's so many things in the genome that evolution would have to account for. And I'm willing to look at those papers, but you're looking at self-organization. You're looking at the communication between the cells with other cells. Yeah, um, I mean, with, with that, though, you're talking about, about the evolution of sort of complex behaviors and, and what spurs that. Um, I, I, was inter I heard an interesting, I was listening to an interesting podcast the other day that covered how behavior... Um, behavior always comes before morphologic change. Um, and, I, and I believe that that is, is sort of amplified even to a very small degree. Um, but yes, I, we'll, we'll have to, yes. to swap papers on that yes. and look a bit more into it. I, I, I did want to make... We're here now. Say you had a time machine and you zoomed forward in time, assuming the Earth was still around at this point, Fast forward a hundred million years, what do you think life would look like? So if we fast forward it a hundred million years from now, yeah. well, I, I think that's actually a good question because, um, you know, based on mutation accumulation, right? I mean, we know we inherit about 100 new mutations per person per generation. And based on the known functionality of, of the genome, most of those are, um, deleterious. So if I were to look a hundred million years in, into the future, I would see uh, extinction because that's exactly where we are heading since there's no type of selection uh, that can remove all these deleterious mutations. Just, you, you, said, you said there that most mutations are deleterious. Yes. That's, that's not true. Well, it is true because most, most of them are neutral. 
No, well, I mean, according to the assumptions of um, evolution, most would be neutral, but that's just because evolutionists assume that the majority of our genome is based on evolutionary leftovers, junk DNA, genomic fossils, but that's actually a direct prediction of the created heterozygosity hypothesis that would suggest that the vast majority of our DNA, our DNA elements, for example, ERVs, ALUs, and these other classes of retrotransposons would be functional. And that's exactly what we're now seeing. That means the more functional the genome is, Adam, can, can the more I, can I just ask qu quickly there, did you make that did they make that prediction before we found that out? Yes, in, in, intelligent design advocates have always predict have always predicted um, genome function increases in, in levels of genome function. That's why the evolutionist community attacks the findings of of the ENCODE project because Adam, the ENCODE project has, has shown that most of the human genome is, is functional and not, and not only that, but functional on many levels. I mean, we have layer upon layer upon layer of, of programming within the, um, the genome. And are, are you familiar with, with all the known functions in these retro transposons and then the endogenous retroviruses and, and pseudogenes? I'm not familiar with every single one, no. Um, yeah, so Dr. Nathaniel Jensen in his model of uh, created heterozygosity, and, and that's why I asked you uh, to clarify your understanding of where we explain uh, the origin of the vast majority of, um, you know, genetic diversity, for example, in, in the nuclear DNA, because it's, it's two opposite expectations and, and predictions. I mean, how much of our genome on a percentage wise, both uh, protein coding and, and non-protein coding, would you say um, is, is functional according to your model? According to my model? I'm not, I'm, I don't know. I don't know the number, unfortunately. What, it, it, it is very low. Like I've, I've uh, debated PhDs on this and, and they have to assume junk for one in order to counterbalance the uh, mutations that are, that are building up in, in the genome because they need to assume that they are neutral, that they're not actually damaging the uh, genome. But even if, and it's, it's funny because the evidence suggests that we, we have a genome of function, but even if, just for sake of argument, uh, you know, just to not uh, discuss this topic forever, even if I said, okay, let's say, let's pretend that the genome really is 90% junk. That still means that's 10 new deleterious mutations that, that are pouring in, into the genome per person, per generation. And most of those being unselectable because natural selection, Adam, only acts on the most detrimental of mutations and the most deleterious mutations, but it does nothing against the nearly neutral mutations. Those are uh, invisible to selection. So my answer to your so, question, if we were to go hundred million years into the future, it's a very simple question. I mean, life, life would not exist. And I guess you would have to explain uh, how natural selection can keep life in existence for, for that long. Go ahead. Yeah, you, you talked about genetic entropy. Now, I, I looked up genetic entropy, and the only places I could find it on Google Scholar were creationist sources, uh, specifically from John Sanford. And all the examples I see are very specific, species-specific examples, mostly humans. Now, the problem with humans in the natural world is that we've sort of done away with natural selection. So, yeah, deleterious mutations are more numerous than beneficial ones. So over time, if there is no selection press, press, pressure, you'll have more of a buildup of deleterious mutations. However, natural selection in the wild, assuming that it's, it's, it's able to do what it needs to do, will prune the wild populations of deleterious um, mutations and keep the positive ones. So right. that's how you maintain populations. That's what natural selection does. It gets rid of the bad and it keeps the good. What's fit for the environment that the creature is living in. That's how populations are sustained and that's how they have been sustained. Right. I really appreciate that response because you made up, you made some good points. I just don't think that you've addressed the nearly neutral mutations that, that would build up because the same thing goes, and I don't want to take all the time. I know Matt has some good examples of uh, genome um, degradation and health, for example, is kind of his specialty. So I'll let him take over in one second, but I do want to point out the fact that, um, yeah, in humans, so you, obviously you're admitting that we are degenerating, but you are uh, um, saying that it's uh, due to a, a lack of natural selection, right? Uh, which right. makes sense, but it would come down to 
um, let's say animal populations, it would still come down to genome function a as a whole, because even in animal populations, they still have to assume that the majority of the genome is junk in order that the junk areas can absorb the mutations, making them neutral. But the fact is, Adam, and you have to address it, is the evolutionist has lost one of their favorite pieces of evidence, which is uh, not only junk DNA, but also the presence of these ancient deactivated viruses that they say are in, in the genome. Because rather than being functionless, um, vestigial remnants of our past, these retrotransposons, as a direct prediction from our model, turn out to be functionally integrated into the amazingly um, complex regulatory uh, genetics and in, in genomes of, of mammalian genomes. So that means that total functionality with all these DNA elements, DNA sequences, will speed up and make the degeneration problem that much worse in humans uh, and I in am, animals. Take your time. I, I am very curious because you keep saying that intelligent design predicted. Who predicted it and when? Um, so, so there have been predictions in, in the past. I can get you specific names. For example, Dr. Jonathan Wells has, has made those types of predictions. Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has in print right now new predictions that the vast majority, over 80% of our genome, because ENCODE, they did what's called biochemical tests, right? So uh, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen predicts that um, using uh, genetic NACO tests will reveal exactly what types of uh, functions these DNA differences have. Because if we predict that the vast majority of DNA differences are actually um, functional, Adam, that would be um, evidence for that exact hypothesis. We're seeing that with the overturning of, of the junk DNA. I mean, what was called junk DNA, we now know can modify the way chromosomes, right, the packages of, of DNA are organized. And then what that does is it changes the, the, the way the DNA functions. It's, it's, DNA function on multiple levels. I mean, how do you non address all that? Non-coding areas of the genome do right. exist in large quantities. And in fact, sure. it's one of the ways that you get um, de novo genes, which explains orphan genes. So for example, uh, a study recently looked at crests, uh, several species of crests, and they found that these lineage specific genes are what they call orphan genes right. were actually just mutations of non-coding DNA that didn't do anything in other species of crests. Right. And, and that's the assumption. So um, No, it's not an assumption. No, they I, test I, I, well, no, I, I understand that, you know, the uh, explanation for these taxonomically restricted and essential genes is de novo gene synthesis. I'll address that in a second. But um, I, I wanted to point out that if, if the genome truly is junk in the non-coding region, most of it, you know, has no active role. Um, but then the ENCODE project has revealed that over 80% of it is actively transcribed into RNA and the evolution say, well, that's just biochemical testing. But my question to you would be, if it truly was junk and there was no useful activity there going on in the non-coding regions, why, Adam, would the cell even bother with it? Because wouldn't you agree that that activity that is discovered would be just a waste of energy and resources and natural selection, which we were talking about earlier, should have eliminated um, that junk long ago, according to evolution. How do you answer that? I, uh, I'd have to look into it more. I couldn't answer off the top of my head without sounding like a complete dunce. <laughs> No, 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 that's okay. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I do want to pass on to Matt Roca because um, his expertise on, on health and, and genetic degeneration, I wanted him to at least point out a few uh, I would examples. like to just interject something here. Um, I would like to eventually get back to kinds because we, we keep drifting back to uh, evolution stuff and, the, well, and no, it, your I, idea I that disprove evolution. Well, no, it's not disproving evolution because um, and, and I know that the... Uh, assumptions and basic worldviews of, of evolution, it's, it's hard to, um, you know, put themselves into the mindset of a creationist because what we're saying is that the vast majority of DNA differences were the result of divine creation. And evolutionist says it's, it's mutations over time. That means we have two very different expectations and predictions on ancestry. You would expect um, you know, a genome of junk, evolutionary left, leftovers and genomic fossils. We would expect a genome of function and DNA elements. That's what's going to help us determine whether or not everything's related or whether or not limited ancestry, uh, according to the Bible, is, is what's true. And that's exactly what, what uh, we're pointing out here and demonstrating. Okay. Is that we so so what, what, could you explain then why 
every every creature, if you test them genetically, comes up into this well-defined tree. Right, and that's a good question. You're, you're going back to the uh, nested hierarchical patterns, the groups within groups patterns that, that we see in life. And as I pointed out in, in the beginning, the design model predicts and expects the exact same thing. That's why we have to look at differentiating evidence, which would be function. How do we test, uh, you know, for ancestry? It, it would be uh, function, a genome of function versus a, a genome of junk. But to, uh, like you said, let's let, let's go more into into kinds and, and more expectations of, um, you know, speciation from say the original kinds because I, I know that's what you want to talk about. And I think that would be enjoyable for um, the audience. But can we just reserve just one second for Matt to jump in and, and make yeah, a point course. about genetic entropy, yeah. and then we'll go right to to kinds and definition of kinds and things like that. Yeah, that's absolutely fine with me. All right, I'll just get it over with real quick. A perfect example is uh, a video that I made which shows uh, Neanderthal. It shows that they have less overall genetic mutations in their entire genome, and today we have a lot more. Um, we also have something called the MTHFR gene, and it's broken anywhere between 40 to 70% in almost all people on Earth. And it's that gene determines on how well you methylate and how well your other genes work and how good they are. So it kind of shows a genome collapse by looking at that. But, you know, that doesn't really have much to do with kinds. It's just an overview of showing that the genome is kind of crumbling and breaking down. We see gene loss. We don't see new genes arising in our genome going up. We see it going down in all life. So I will, uh, I will, I will just put a point on that. We do see genes arising. I mentioned the CRESS earlier where they identified many non-coding sequences um, becoming de novo genes. So we do see increases in genes. We also see anatomical increases, which are results of genes. So for an instance, dogs, um, more primitive dogs, uh, wolves and huskies uh, don't have puppy dog eyes because they lack two muscles around the eyes. Um, whereas more recent breeds of dogs have these muscles. And that is a result of mutations that came about uh, to benefit dogs that live with us because we love puppy dog eyes. I think that's a beautiful example of evolution in action that happened during human history. But the uh, but these de novo genes that are arising spontaneously, kind of like out of nowhere, that really are considered uh, junk DNA are actually functional elements. So we can't just say that these are randomly arising, but yet these de novo genes are absolutely required for functions in the gene in, in the body. If they were just, that's what makes the uh, the orphan gene so fascinating is because they're lineage specific. So it also helps prove our model a little bit because they are taxonomically restrictive genes, but they're also functional elements, which Standing mentioned earlier. The fact um, that the fact that genes become active from non-coding genes, it, I don't see how it proves your point. I don't see how uh, it lines up with it. And, and I personally. like I like your point on orphan genes. Um, Adam, but I, we would just have to see actual, you know, papers that are showing a non-coding region of our genome suddenly popping up and having an in, incredible, incredibly functional role. Because um, okay. evolution... if you look at the one on Cress, it was quite recent. If you look up Cress, uh, Cress de novo genes on Google Scholar over the last, I think, I think it was 2016. If you look it, there's right. about 500 um, de novo it's... genes that come up from non-coding regions. And we have looked at, at many papers, I just want to put this out there, is that in what you're saying, just to reiterate, um, these orphan genes were created um, supposedly from just uh, random mutational events in the non-coding regions, and um, they've now uh, co-opted function in the uh, protein coding regions. They're not, right? Is that how you would explain the, the orphan we, genes? We see, we see the non-coding regions. The, the reason we didn't see them before is because they were non-coding, so we didn't know, right. really know what we are looking for. But when we found these genes in this certain species of crest, we look back at other species of crest and check for that same sequence and find that it's a non-coding region of the DNA. Well, I, I'm, I'm saying crest, I'm assuming you think crest would be in, within the same kind. I am right, right. Well, and I'm just saying, I'll give you plenty of time. I'm just saying that because evolutionists reject this concept of, of engineered design in, in biological uh, systems, when they see the presence of these taxonomically uh, restricted orphan genes, they have to come up with a way as to how these uh, cleverly, you know, designed DNA sequences were um, somehow randomly uh, 
generated in very recent evolutionary time and, and you look to de novo gene synthesis but my response to that would be that it's it's based more on a circular argument because evolutionists say okay de novo gene synthesis must be true because why orphan genes exist and orphan genes exist because of de novo gene synthesis so not i don't know how there, you there, are, there are various sure. methods for de novo um not de novo genes orphan genes you've also got things like fission and fusion of genes you've got um, gene duplication and exon shuffling uh, off the top of my head. Right, right. But a lot of times in these papers, for example, um, one that I <clears throat> myself are really familiar with are the so-called introduction of new orphan genes in fruit flies. Uh, Matt, did you want to touch on that real quick? Because orphan genes, you must understand, for one, could be lost as well, which could explain why you're seeing some in, uh, you know, some species in, in the same kind that other species in the same kind don't have. Did you want to touch on that real quick, Matt? Yeah, real quick. They, they took fruit flies and they, they looked inside of their uh, orphan gene status and they wanted to try to um, get them out. So what they did is they bred fruit flies, a specific species of them, to have zero um, orphan genes in their bodies just to see what would happen. So they bred them entirely out after maybe uh, 10 generations or so, completely gone. So the flies were living without any orphan genes in their body. Okay, I just want to make a correction. I said 2016 for the Crest paper is actually 2011. So if you wanted to search it on, it's a paper from 2011. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, Please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Good evening, folks. Ken Hovind here and the crew at Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama, April 29th, 2020. Man, if I'd have known I was going to live this long, I'd have probably eaten more ice cream. Ha! <laughs> anyway, we're the folks who believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. God made everything in six days. Dinosaurs always lived with man. And evolution is one of the dumbest and most dangerous religions in the history of the world. Teach the kids that came from a rock. And they do teach that. Now, so I almost got to that Q&A tonight. We'll get there again. We've been looking high and low for one functioning brain cell in those who claim there's no God and, all, and we all came from a dot of nothing. I think that's ridiculous. So whack an atheist is an easy game to learn. Uh, whack an atheist, like whack-a-mole. When they stick their head up, whack it back down. So when an atheist makes, sticks his head up, makes a dumb claim, uh, whack it back down. Even small children can learn how to play the game. The Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. And you're a fool to believe there's no God. But a rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. And you smite the scorner and the simple will beware. Okay, I have been looking high and low for what is the best evidence for evolution. I was almost going to do this tonight and just whack several atheists at once. But <clears throat> several months ago in my debate with a guy who calls himself the um, or conspiracy cats, he asked me to show how ERVs did not prove evolution. I'd never heard anyone use them as evidence for evolution, so I said I'm not prepared for that. He and other atheists have used my deferral as evidence for their religion of evolution. They're saying Hovind wasn't prepared for that, therefore that's proof for evolution. A guy named Weist Rhino on Twitter said, uh, someone needs to get a Kent Hovind, I'm not prepared for that gif into that said the only gift that comes for a search for Hovind is something else, okay? The Dutch atheist wrote in, uh, I'm not prepared for that, Hovind's latest release. Somebody actually did a song. I'm not prepared for that, an atheist did. He has uh, 15 subscribers to his channel and 117 views. Wow, and he did a whole song, I'm not prepared for that. Charlie Chimp wrote in, eight hours ago, it's downloaded today. Kent still not prepared for that. Uh, so why do you refuse to debate conspiracy cats? He agreed to debate for the rematch, but you never rescheduled. He's not prepared for that. So what he was talking about was, he said, endogenous retroviruses are proof for evolution. Endogenous, endo means inside, exo means outside. So endogenous means in the genes, gen, gene code, gen, endogenous retrovirus. Well, endogenous, growing or reproduced or produced by growth from deep tissue caused by factors inside the organism or system. Endogenous, produced within or caused by factors within the organism. Retrovirus, 
a mem any member of a large family of RNA viruses that includes, and it names several of them here, including uh, HIV. They're saying this is evidence for evolution, that we all came from a rock. Okay, for the guys from Standing for Truth that are standing by here, uh, I have been told by uh, the, uh, what did somebody else suggest we call him? Not Conspiracy Cats, the, uh, nobody had another name for him. Uh, fallacious feline or something like that. Anyway, that he said endogenous retroviruses are evidence for evolution. And uh, the guys from Standing for Truth, uh, you and Matt have, I understand, uh, done some research on this. Can you tell everybody what your thoughts are on endogenous retroviruses? Is this evidence for evolution? Of course, good question, uh, Dr. Holden. I wanted to say hi to you and everybody at Dow. Uh, it's a blessing to be on your program, and you've, uh, your ministry has been a tremendous uh, influence on my life, so uh, God bless. Well, thank you, sir. And no problem. Um, yeah, I, uh, I do enjoy tackling this argument. Um, what I'm going to do, Dr. Holden, is I'm going to destroy uh, endogenous retroviruses right now. I'm going to cram about hours and hours worth of information into just roughly a three-minute explanation, breaking it down. Uh, Dr. Holman, this all comes down to the evolutionist assumption that the vast majority of our genome is based on evolutionary leftovers, genomic fossils. You've heard it before, Dr. Holman, junk DNA. Right. So they base their argument, and Conspiracy Cats bases his argument on these BRDs, on a false... A uh, false premise and a false starting point. Um, firstly, I've, I've had numerous debates with evolutionists, biologists, for example, uh, many of the same ones you've actually debated, Dr. Holden, including conspiracy cats. And um, in my debate with cats, we discussed ERDs in great detail. So for anybody who would like to see that debate, just go over to my channel, uh, subscribe if, if you like the Young Earth Creation material we're, we're putting out, and you can search for that debate. But the most crucial question to ask on this uh, topic, Dr. Hoban, is are ERVs and other various classes of these retrotransposons, are they the leftover remnants of ancient viral infections in our DNA? That's what the evolutionists would have us believe. Right? right. Are they, uh, or are they created units of, of DNA function? Because as you know, Dr. Hoban, based on the design model, we would, of course, expect and predict that the vast majority of our DNA and these DNA elements are the result of initial design and therefore should be functional and not junk like uh, the evolutionists would, uh, right. would assume. So, <laughs> Dr. Hoban, what does the evidence suggest? Well, I'll go over that real quick. Uh, we, um, we now know that not only these ERVs, Dr. Hoban, but also other classes of retrotransposons and the so-called parasitic DNA that they'll refer to as, they accomplish many crucial functions in just to name a couple, in regulating gene expression, cell differentiation and development. So it looks as if these are not actually remnants of viral infections, but functional DNA units. And you could read paper after paper after paper um, from the secular, from the secularist, do documenting the various nu uh, numerous uh, functions found in these ERVs. For example, you can even read straight from some of these papers they talk about how these endogenous retroviruses frequently act to distribute regulatory information and thus confer genes in patterns of expression and function. Now, Pelogia, who you've lacked before, and you've done a great job doing it, Dr. Hogan, huh? I watched his response video to your um, last video on ERV. Uh, their response to this, and I'll just destroy this real quick, They'll say that these functions we're talking about, Dr. Hovind, were co-op. What that means is that these functions were adopted by the ERVs, um, these crucial functions. So that's more philosophy, though, because now they've jumped to fairy tale. Because claiming that they were co-opted is more uninformative gloss with no real empirical evidence. Right. So I always ask the evolutionists. This is what I asked conspiracy cats in my debate. I said, okay. If these functions were co-opted or adopted, then show me a paper, any empirical evidence that actually demonstrates a non-functional ERV going from non-functional to extremely functional in the genome. And I've debated a, a biologist before, Dr. Hovind, and he said word for word, if, if I said I could show you one of those, I'd be lying. Because remember, that's their, that's their philosophy. Uh, and one other question you can ask them too, Dr. Hovind, is 
if viral DNA is inserted at random into the genome, it is much more likely to disrupt existing genes. For example, a blindfolded painter will most likely mess up the painting he is working on by just applying random brush strokes to it. But the fact that we see these DNA elements are extremely functional to our genetics suggests that this is uh, simply evidence for uh, common design based on shared function. So, so these uh, endogenous retroviruses that they're claiming are evidence, I'll show you, here's the charts they use in the books. They'll say humans and gorillas and gibbons, for instance, have certain ERVs uh, spaced, placed someplace in their genome, <clears throat> and that proves that we are related X number of million years ago. They have the oldest uh, HERVL -E insertions were 100 to 150 million years ago. So, the, but see, the ERVs weren't even discovered until 1960s. And so right. they were teaching right. evolution for 100 years before that. So now they're saying this is the best evidence for evolution. I say, guys, hold it. Think about that for a minute. You were teaching this for 100 years before you had any evidence? All the other evidence has been disproven, which I cover in my video number four, lies in the textbooks. And so what was their response when you pointed out that ERVs uh, all have a function? Yeah, so they would just say that they were uh, co-opted through mutation. But they can't actually demonstrate that uh, empirically, Dr. Holden. Um, they're just inferring that. It's, it's more so their philosophy. And, and you made a good point, too. They'll say, oh, we can watch these insertions. And you pointed this out, I believe, is in your debate with Mark Drysdale, and it was a great point, that, uh, no, we can't see these uh, viruses being inserted. They see these elements in our genetics, and they assume that they were inserted right. millions of years ago in some past common ancestors. So that. Uh, like you say, that's where they jump from science to fairy tale. But the, uh, the functions prove, so for example, like you pointed out, Dr. Hovind, they'll point to some endogenous retroviral element that we share with the chimpanzees. And um, it's not a surprise to us that we may share more of these DNA elements with the chimpanzee than we would with, say, um, you know, an old world monkey or a dog or a fish. Because, I mean, if you look at anatomy, morphology, physiology, we share more in common with the chimp anyway. So, of course, we would share more of those elements with the chimp than with, uh, you know, a creature that we share less in, in anatomy with as well. But um, it, actually, Ron, did you have a point uh, there, brother? Oh, yeah. I mean, I can, I can interject at any point, but uh, I kind of wanted to give people kind of a rundown on basically why evolutionists think that this is such great evidence. So I, I can touch on what you are, or <laughs> I can jump right in. Yeah, I'd like to hear Matt's response to that. Why, why did they jump on this? Over, this, over the last century and a half, they, they, they keep switching what their best evidence for evolution is, because it keeps getting disproven. And when, when conspiracy, conspiracy Cats brought that up, I said, I'm not prepared for that. I've never heard anybody use that as evidence for evolution. So uh, that it doesn't mean it can't be prepared for. Yeah, but it's ridiculous. Now, you guys' channel, Standing for Truth, they can go there and see uh, videos uh, about this topic. Uh, is that correct? Uh, yeah. Um, matter of fact, he just had a debate on that very topic. Um, he even brought it up with Erica last night in the debate. So most of the time, the questions get asked because, as you know, you do lots of debates, and so they like to throw a lot of things at you in the Q&A at this point. So right. they're always trying to stump you because if you can't answer a question, then it's a victory to them. Right. So basically, they're coming at any new angle, so that's why they do like the new ERV angle. It's, okay. It's a good one for them because they right. go, oh, we got him. Yeah, we got him. Matt, what's your thoughts on ERVs? Well, basically, evolutionists consider them ancient fossilized footprints. Basically, they're long, long ago viruses that are left behind in the body that we can see remnants of. Basically, picture an ancient ancestor in your mind. Let's call it Bigfoot for right now, okay? Half human, half ape. So now, Bigfoot probably did some things that he wasn't supposed to do and decided to swim in a swamp or something ridiculous, and he got bombarded by tons of ancient viral infections. But Bigfoot was strong, so he fought off these viruses. And he lived to pass on these new, now inactive viruses to his offspring through the germ line. This kept happening generation after generation until literally thousands of these viruses that had attacked his genome are now inactivated and have accumulated through time. 
they wanted to complete, uh, uh, they actually were complete ERVs during this time. They're called HERVKs. Now, um, what happened is they broke up into pieces, and that's what we call ERVs today. So then, when Bigfoot diverged, creating chimpanzees and then the human line, um, basically each line brought with them ERVs from that common ancestor, Big, you know, Daddy Bigfoot. So that's what we're seeing. We see these fossil footprints inside of us, and evolutionists believe that we're looking at these ERVs that are inside of our bodies today that came from basically matching up in the chimpanzee position from this ancient common ancestor. So they think. That is the best evidence for evolution because it proves that we have a common ancestor. But we creationists come along and say, wait a minute, hold on. Let's just look at a couple things before we make that conclusion. Are these ERVs really useless, junk, fossilized remnants of viruses? Well, look, they actually have many functions. So why are dead viruses now having functions in our model? Well, they say, you know, they didn't predict this. So that's the rescuing device. They say, well, there's so many of them now. That's why some of them evolved functions. Uh -huh. So for no reason at all, other than the sheer amount of them that are inside the body, they activated, but not in a bad way. They actually activated in ways that are good for us. For example, some ERVs actually fight viruses, the very thing that they are. So they want us to believe that an ancient, useless, long ago virus beneficially activated and then went rogue and started killing its own kind. Does that make any sense to you, Dr. Owen? Well, it does because they're so desperate to want to believe in evolution. They want so badly to get rid of God, they will jump on anything, anything, as evidence. Uh, but it looks to me like we have a common designer. Uh, I mean, Charlie Darwin thought right. the cell was nothing but a bag of jelly. I mean, he did not know the function of all the complex things. And now we know one cell is more complex than the space shuttle. So they can't use that anymore. So this ERVs is the latest one from the uh, plotting pussy who thinks he's, <laughs> he's brilliant, you know. <laughs> right. Well, the more they study these things, the worse it gets for them because they've started looking at even these really small fragments that are really short in base pairs. And they discovered over 51,000 51, of them. They initiate transcription on a large scale with inside of us. And others are epigenetic markers, they're DNA methylation, they're associated with binding sites. And then the critics will go, well, some of them cause problems, but yeah, that's because all of them have lethal mutations in them. That's why. It's not because they're still viruses, it's because they're riddled with mutations, just like our model of genetic entropy. Right. Mutations cause harm. You know, they cause problems. Ed function ed functionless ancient viruses in the genome, they wouldn't act like this. But here's the kicker right here. Uh, without ERVs, we couldn't even have offspring. Without ERVs located at, at a cell two location or the second level, embryogenesis won't even occur. So we won't even be developing embryos if we don't have ERVs in our system. But that's, I mean, that's just ludicrous to think that these are worthless remnants of something. But it gets even worse because there's more evidence that they're required for life because two families of ERVs were discovered to produce functional proteins during the formation of the placenta meaning they're critical for the cellular fusion of underlying mammalian placental formation and maintenance. So again, no offspring could be born without ERV. And they expect us to believe that these are just fossil remnants. Like, what did what did life do before these were embedded in the body and became useless? Well, it's very right? simple. Well, for, for millions of years, nobody had babies. But then, 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 they yeah. just, <laughs> then it slowly worked. It, it, give, them that, <laughs> give them time. Give them time. It'll work. For millions of years, yeah. So when they come along and they say, the final assertion, and now they can finally have babies. That's how ridiculous this argument is, Dr. Holden. Yeah. Well, if you really want to put, if you want to want to finish them off, just tell them this. Uh, they'll, they'll say, well, not all ERVs have function. Well, remember, first of all, they don't test for function. They believe they're functionless. So nobody's really out going out right and saying, oh, look, let's go test these things and see what they do. They're not. But what we do know is that ATP is being used by ERVs. The body does not ever use give up energy on something that's pointless and useless. It would never waste energy. Right. So the fact that ATP is being used by these things, that's proof right there that they do have a function. All right. Well, and Dr. Holman, you always give a really good analogy with 
um, with, with a kid. For example, we understand so little of the DNA language of the genetic code, and oftentimes I've heard you give the analogy that it's like a kid looking underneath the hood of a car. You know, if you told him to just remove anything in that under that hood that you believe is useless, he's going to start tearing things out left and right because he doesn't know the uses of, of, of these things, you know? Right, it's a matter of his level of understanding is kindergarten level. He doesn't know what that does. And it, it, that's the way with our human genome, you know, I, like a computer code. How many lines of code are there to Microsoft PowerPoint? Tens of thousands? Millions? Maybe? I don't know. So right. what if somebody's looking through all these lines of code and say, what do we need this for? Take it out. You may, you may crash the whole program. Uh, one little mistake in a code can crash the program. Don't they have patches all the time they have to put on? Yeah. All right. Yep. Well, thank you so much, right. fellas. And go to Standing for Truth. Uh, that's your YouTube channel? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Standing for Truth. Uh, we, we put out almost daily material on Young Earth Creation. You've been on our channel. You, you've blessed us with your presence for about, I think, 10 debates you've, uh, you've done on my channel. So, yeah, anyone interested, they can uh, look us up and subscribe. Sounds great. Thank you so much, guys, for coming on. And uh, you get uh, Conspiracy Cats uh, educated on that one. Here's my prediction. If he finally realizes or admits, which I doubt he will do, but if he ever admits, you know, ERVs are not proof for evolution. Rather than repent and get saved, he will go searching for something else to back up his theory. Because he needs that theory to reject God. There's only two choices. There is a God or there isn't. Nobody's thought of a third choice. So if there's a God, then he owns the place. He's, he, he, he makes the rules, do what he says. They don't like that. So I predict you will demolish him on ERVs and he will still not get converted. He will go on to the next one. And then if you can demolish that one, he'll go on to something else. That's what the evolutionists have done for 160 years. They don't want God in their life. That's the problem. That's Second Peter. Prediction. Yep. Thank you so much, guys, and uh, st Standing for Truth, get a hold of their channel and watch it and subscribe and tell others about it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Ken. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Oak, and God bless. All right. Come visit Alabama. Bring a hammer. we got work to do, okay? All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Well, thank you so much. And for those who enjoy this channel and would love to support us financially, please feel free to hit that donate link. We'd greatly appreciate it. God bless. Well, because I've even got a, a, another paper here and I can post them in the chat, app, the chat after. It says ERVs frequently act to distribute regulatory information and, the, and thus confer genes with new patterns of expression and function. And I mean, I can go on and on, but, but for sake of time, I'm not going to. These, even if we just look at the, the greater um, class of retrotransposons, the fact that they're extremely good for us, they can, like, that's why some of them are called jumping genes. They can jump around in the, in the genome and they can turn on and off various types of um, genes.